we need to understand temperature and dew point. Uh, temperature and dew point is if we have a volume of air, and in that volume of air there's water molecules, but the air is warm, let's say 25 degrees Celsius, that these water molecules, remember everything is in constant random motion, these water molecules will bounce off of each other, but not stick together. And let's say, for example, that the dew point was 20 degrees Celsius. If we take this same volume of air and we simply cool it, the, water, the uh, molecules will slow down. So as the water molecules bump into each other, they tend to stay stuck together. And as soon as enough of them stay stuck together, then we can see them with our eyes. So the dew point is the temperature at which visible moisture would appear. So in this example, we started with the temperature 25 and the dew point 20. And we cooled this air so that the temperature was the same as the dew point. And that is the point where visible moisture occurred. So fog or clouds would appear when the temperature dew point merged. Now we could have added more water to this scenario and increased the saturation, which would raise the dew point. But either way, whenever the temperature dew point are the same, your visible moisture will occur. So as a pilot, specifically early evenings, um, in the wintertime particularly, when the temperature dew point start getting closer and closer together, let's say that the temperature was uh, 3 and the dew point was 1, and then the temperature was, excuse me, the temperature was 2 and then the dew point 1, and then finally the temperature and the dew point are the same, then fog can form, form very, very quickly. So again, temperature dew point, dew point is the temperature at which a visible moisture would occur. Another concept that we need to understand is adiabatic cooling. Adiabatic cooling is known as expansion cooling. If we force air up independently of the existing lapse rate, that forced air up cools at a very, very predict uh, predictable rate. So for example, if we had a little balloon and the temperature in the balloon was 12 degrees Celsius, and you took that balloon up in the airplane with you, and you took it up 1,000 feet, then the temperature in that balloon would drop because of expansion. As the balloon went up, the, there was less atmospheric pressure around it, so it allowed to expand. So there was less fric friction, there was less heat. So the temperature in the balloon would become 9 degrees Celsius. And as you go up again, the temperature would drop again at a very predictable 3 degrees per thousand feet. And that is known as adiabatic cooling. And adiabatic cooling, known as expansion cooling, is something maybe you've seen in your own life. For example, if you've ever run a gas grill, uh, the gas that was compressed in that tank, when you open the uh, gas and allow the gas to escape, the tank becomes very cool. Why did it cool? It was because you're allowing the gas to uh, be released out of the tank, leaving the remainder, remaining gas to expand. And as it expands, there's less friction, so it cools off, and it leaves your tank cool. That's an example of adiabatic cooling. We're going to get into this a little bit deeper when we talk about stability of the atmosphere, but I just need to introduce you to these terms. Lapse rate is the temperature measured as we go up in the atmosphere, and adiabatic cooling is when we force air up independently of the lapse rate, how that air will cool. And you may say, well, how can you force air up? Well, a very quick example would be um, if there were mountains. If there were some mountains here and the air was blowing like this, then that air has to go somewhere, so it would be forced up. And it would cool at a rate independently of the existing temperature there. The next thing we want to look at is when we have this rising and falling air, what does it do? If we have air that is cold and falling, it's going to put more pressure on the barometer and give us a higher barometric pressure. So that is known as a high pressure system. So this would be a profile view of a high pressure system. And this air was really cold, that's why it started descending. And as the air molecules in this high pressure system descend, they can't just stay piled up on themselves because everything strives to meet some kind of equilibrium. 
So as these air molecules descend, they sprawl outward. And remember the Coriolis effect is that things will spin off to the right as they try to travel across the northern hemisphere. So as we look at the profile view of a high pressure system, it would be a colder air that is descending and sprawling outward. And if we looked at that from an aerial view, then the air would, as it tries to sprawl outward, it would circle in a clockwise fashion. Now in comparison to the high pressure or cold air, let's look at warm air. Warm air is going to do the opposite. So this is really warm air in relation to this, and so it rises. And as it rises, it puts less pressure on the uh, barometer, so it gives us a lower reading on the barometer. And as this air rises, it's allowed to expand as it goes up. So at the surface, the low pressure would come in up, and it would spin counterclockwise. So if this were a low pressure system, as seen from above, the air would spin counterclockwise. Um, both of them are affected by the Coriolis effect. It's just the fact that one's descending and turning right, and the other one is rising and turning right. But most of the time we talk about the aerial view because that's how we look at, at um, these on our surface analysis chart. So the high pressure system goes clockwise and the low pressure system goes counterclockwise. When they draw a line between the high pressure system and the low pressure system to distinguish the two systems, they call it a front. And you may see, you may see a front line drawn in blue and it has little points on it. You can think of like icicles. What this is illustrating is that this high pressure system, even air, though this air is sinking and sprawling out and turning clockwise, this whole air mass that has uniform properties is moving in this direction. So when they draw a front line, they just show the direction that the front is moving, or the front, the direction that the pressure system is moving. If this uh, low pressure system was moving up in this direction as one whole air mass, then they would draw it with red and put bubbles on it. You can think of like boiling water. So this entire warm air mass, this low pressure system, is rising and turning clockwise and moving in that direction. So they call this one a warm front. So this one is a warm, warm front. And the other one is a cold front. And if you had, let's say for example, there was a, another uh, low pressure system that was pushing in this direction down here. So there was another low here and it was spinning this way, and it started pushing maybe air out of the Gulf Coast, pushing up toward um, the US, then what happens is when the two fronts pushed against each other and neither one is winning, like one's not pushing the other one out of the way, then they call it a stationary front. And so they will draw points and bubbles opposing each other to show you that there's no movement, that the cold air and the warm air met, and they're just stuck there. And they call that a stationary front. So a stationary front. The last type of front you could have is called an occluded front. And an occluded front is drawn in purple, which I don't have a purple marker, so I'm just going to draw it in green. But a, an occluded front would look like point, bubbles, point, bubbles, all on the same side. And what the occluded front is showing you is that this cold air caught up with this warm air that was catching up with cool air in front of it. So three temperatures actually started merging together. And they draw it like this, but it would be typically in uh, purple color if, they, if you had it on a color chart. But it would be points and bubbles to indicate which direction the whole occluded front is moving in, but that you understand that three temperatures were merging together. The other thing that we want to take a look at is the pressures as they get closer and farther away from the center of these highs and lows. The center of the high on your surface analysis chart is usually depicted with an H. And let's just say, for example, that the center of this high pressure system was uh, 3052 inches of mercury. And then they take pressure readings all around the, uh, the United States or even the world 
And everywhere that the pressure is the same, they kind of connect the dots. So let's say that um, everywhere around this circle, the pressure was uh, 30, 32. The pressure dropped uh, 0.2. And then as they were taking pressure readings around, then everybody in this area had a pressure reading of 30, one, two. So every time the pressure drops at a certain uh, rate, then they will connect the dots to illustrate where the pressure is dropping and how quickly it drops. And they'll do the same thing for the low. So on the, in the center of the low, your pressure could be uh, 28, 92, for example. And then as you go out away from that pressure, then the pressure would become uh, more and more. So maybe uh, 29, uh, 22 and, and so on, 29, 52 or whatever, but they'll draw lines, little circles, to show where these the pressure changes, and they call those pressure gradient lines, and we call those isobars. So isobars are pressure gradient lines, and to us, it lets us know how quickly the pressure is rising or falling, and if you see the isobars very close together, the pressure is changing rapidly, so it would be very windy. You could think about um, if you had a, a balloon blown up and you have all that air pressure in there inside the balloon. If you pop the balloon, then the air disperses rapidly and, and you would feel a bit of breeze. So when the isobars, which show pressure gradients, uh, are close together, you would expect it to be very windy. Now, most of the time, these pressure systems stay in these nice little circles like this, but sometimes because one pressure pushes and shoves the others around, you may have um, more of an elongated shape around that pressure system. And an elongated shape associated with a high, they call a ridge. And if you had a pressure that was sort of elongated, almost looks like a panhandle, associated with a low, then they call that a trough. Well, what does that mean to you as a pilot? Well, typically if you have high pressure, that is colder sinking air, and usually brings us sunny skies, sunny blue skies. But if you have a low pressure system, then that's warm rising air, and as air rises, it cools and condenses into visible moisture. So typically, associated with a low front, you would have clouds or rain. So if you had an extension of a low over your area, you would also expect clouds and rain. So a trough is associated with a low, and a ridge is associated with a high pressure. Now on the charts, they don't uh, mark where ridges are, but on the charts for a, a low, they usually will draw a, an orange line, something like this, just to denote just to denote where that uh, trough extends. And you could have a high on both sides of that trough, so you could have a high pressure here and a high pressure here. And those high pressures that are sinking are almost pinching or squeezing that air, and you would expect to have some sort of weather, maybe storms, depends on the time of the year, but you would expect to have some type of uh, storms associated with that low pressure system.